we are going to go ahead and get started. It is 6 o'clock, so I will go ahead and call to order the June 7th, 2022 Placerville Planning Commission meeting at 6 p.m. If everyone can stand and join me for the pledge, we will envision our beautiful flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Mr. Ross, please call roll. Uh, Commissioner Friend? Here. Vice Chair Gopper? Here. Commissioner Keeney? Here. Chair Lepper? Here. Commissioner List? Here. Got a full house today. We have a full house for the first time in a while. So Moved to, to buy the house. everybody on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We do not have any closed session report to report out on tonight, and so we will move to the adoption of our agenda. Uh, move to adopt. Okay. Sure. Okay, so motion by Commissioner Gopberg, second by Commissioner List to adopt the agenda as stated. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the agenda passes with full adoption. Next, we'll move to our consent calendar. We'll, we'll approve the minutes of our regular planning commission meeting from May 17th, 2022. I would move to adopt okay. uh, approving the minutes. Great. I will second that. Those in favor of adopting the minutes from the May 17th, 2022 meeting, say aye. 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 Any opposed or abstain? Abstain. Abstain. Okay. We have two abstentions due to absence at the meeting of Commissioner Friend and Commissioner Keeney. Um, so next we will go to items pulled from the, hey, hello there. Items pulled from the consent calendar, which we have none today. And so next we'll move to item number seven, which is items of interest to the public. This is the opportunity for members of the public to address the commission on non-agendized items. Is there any member of the public wishing to address the commission on agenda topics not on tonight's agenda? I think I'm on the agenda. You're on the agenda, okay, great, okay. <laughs> So seeing no one else in the audience, I will go ahead and close the public um, comment portion and move to our written communications. Do we have any written communications tonight, Mr. Ross? Uh, no written communications, okay. Chair. Great, thank you. And do we have any presentations or educational workshops? We do have none tonight. Great. So we'll move right along to our 10.1 Environmental Assessment Public Hearing Site Plan Review 82-18-R which is a consideration to change the building exterior at 1008 Fowler Way. Mr. Voss? Uh, that staff report is going to be provided by our new uh, associate planner, Kristen Hunter. Fantastic. Oh, how Ms. Hunter. <laughs> I, I missed, obviously I missed the introduction. You must have been introduced at the last meeting, possibly? Um, May 2nd. May 2nd. Okay, so For, I yeah. wasn't here May 17th if you were introduced, so... How exciting that is. Yes. We're very pleased to, to have her. She has been taking a huge burden off my shoulders. I think she Only imagine. <laughs> 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 She's fantastic. Well then, please, take it away. All right. Okay. Um, so this is the request from the applicant to consider a revision to site plan review 82-18 to change the existing building exterior from horizontal with left siding and vertical T111 to stucco. And also to consider a categorical exemption from the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, for guidelines section 15301, which allows for the minor alterations of an existing structure that result in negligible or no change in the former use. Then background on the building. Uh, construction of the building located at um, 1008 Fowler Way was completed in the fall of 1983 and included an L-shaped building, parking lot, and retaining wall. Beyond the directly adjacent medical and dental facilities, to the north is Sierra Elementary School, to the south, Marshall Medical Center, and to the east and west, single-family and multi-family residential neighborhoods. Directly adjacent to the front of the entrance of the building is a parking lot with a total of 26 stalls. In 2021, the parcel was sold to the new owners, and the building and interior was remodeled to remove all interior non-structural partition walls in order to begin the process of creating two dental offices inside the existing building for the new parcel owners. Um, as proposed, SPR 8218R would modify the exterior to match the adjacent buildings, shown in Figure 3 of the staff report, and result in a more professional and consistent appearance. In reviewing the application and site conditions, staff, staff finds the site suitable and adequate for the proposed exterior alteration, and that the proposed alteration is in harmony with the general plan's community design goals and policies. 
Furthermore, the request is consistent with the City of Placerville's development guide in that the new exterior of the building will, visual, will be visually compatible with surrounding buildings. Therefore, staff recommends the Planning Commission take the following action. Adopt the staff report as part of the public record. Make the following findings of fact in support of SPR 8218R, uh, including that the request is exempt from CEQA section 15301, which exempts projects involving but not limited to the operation, repair, maintenance, permitting, leasing, licensing, or minor alteration of existing structure, um, resulting in negligible or no change in former use. The request is consistent and in harmony with the general plan in that it will encourage the restoration and reuse of an older structure. The request would further goal I, policy three, of the community design element through the use of materials that are suited to the area and are consistent with surrounding buildings. And lastly, approve SPR 8218R, located at 1008 Fowler Way, based on the project information and findings included in the staff report and subject to the recommended conditions of approval. Conditions of approval from SPR 82-18 are included in the staff report, along with a new condition, condition E. The conditions are as follows. A, sign and record an agreement with the adjacent property owners on the south for grading and maintenance of retaining walls on both properties. B, submit detail of any additional signs for planning commission approval. C, submit proposed retaining wall materials for staff approval. D, extend the walkway to Fowler Way. And E, a project owner or his, her, successors, heirs, assigns, shall record a landscaping maintenance agreement prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy for the site in accordance with city code section 10-4-9, set plan review. Fantastic, thank you very much for that. Okay, good, do any commissioners have any questions for staff based on the report that you received? I have one question, uh -huh. if I may, Madam Chair. Um, with regards to new condition E, uh, when this was approved previously, was there a landscape re recorded? There was that, not. Okay. We just didn't do that back then, is that kind of? I believe it was adopted in 2015, the nope. requirement. Okay, gotcha. All right. Good. Thank you. Nope, any other questions? Okay. I have a question. Yes. Where's the retaining wall? Um, they didn't, I don't see a picture. Did I just not realize what I was looking at? Is it, I see on page three, is it the top right? Um, is that where the retaining wall is going to go? Other than, so this is only for the changing of the exterior of the building. Um, we included conditions of approval from the, the build of the original building, which includes the retaining wall. So this would just be for the applicant to confirm that all conditions of approval are met before uh, okay. we can see. Yeah, Chair, if I could just add. So basically what, what staff did here is we just, um, we just copied, if you will, the conditions of approval for the original site plan review we're only adding addition E because that's required under code and we don't have a landscaping agreement. The retaining wall is already in and we do have an agreement already for the retaining wall. Mm -hmm. But it's always left in because five, 10 years from now, maybe the retaining wall needs maintenance or some issue. So we don't delete the conditions, we just carry them forward. I, I remember in the report, I think it said A, that it was met already, that yeah. one. Yeah, okay. Okay, any other questions on that? No, perfect. Do we know was the building in being occupied at this point? I do not believe so, no. They're still doing interior um, alterations. Okay. okay, perfect. Okay, so if there's no more questions, then we'll <clears throat> just one yes, more. I don't know if we mm -hmm. know the answer, uh, but how is uh, the facade going to change? Uh, is Will it still have the same architectural look, just where we see wood siding is going to be stuck over? They're not going to make this building look like uh, the adjacent ones. No other changes or architectural features. Yeah, they're not going to other than change the change, 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 change in site. Yeah. Strictly the change in site. Okay. So it will look like like these pictures, just a new material. Flow into like the one on the next page, I think. Like beads. Seeing none right now, and I'll have a chance in a minute too. Again, I will go ahead and open uh, this up for public comment. So, if any members of the public wish to make a comment on this uh, site plan review, you may stand up here and approach the commission. No comment. Okay, great. <laughs> Seeing no comment on this topic, I will go ahead and close public comment for this hearing and return the matter to commissioners for discussion and action. Um, I didn't have. Two 
too many questions on it. The only clarification I did wonder is, is A on figure three going to be painted as well, or is that just an example of a stucco building near it? That's an example of a adjacent okay. building. Okay, I thought so. I just wanted to make sure that I was interpreting that correctly. Anyone else have any comments or questions on this application? No. No? I would... No one knows in a historic district. Not in a historic district. Much more straightforward. It is. Well, <laughs> okay. I'll uh, move to adopt the staff report as part of the public record, make the findings as listed in the staff report, and approve SPR 8218R uh, in accordance with the conditions of approval listed in the staff report. One second. second the battle for a second. Pick your poison. Um, so we have a first and a second to approve the application as submitted. Um, I will go ahead and ask Mr. Voss to call roll. Commissioner Friend? Aye. Vice Chair Gopper? Aye. Commissioner Keeney? Aye. Chair Lever? Aye. Commissioner Liz? Aye. Okay, so the application has passed as um, submitted. A reminder that there is a 10-day calendar appeal period for planning commission decisions that can be made by a written <coughs> request to City Hall. Okay, so moving on to our next topic, we have number 11-11.1, or .1, which is a zoning text change 22-01 for short-term rental uses within the Central Business District, the Commercial Zone District, and the Highway Commercial Zone District. Mr. Voss. Thank you, Chair Lepper, uh, members of the Planning Commission. Just a quick uh, recap. Uh, this is a request by the City Council. This is per the Resolution of Intent 8530 that the Planning Commission consider amendments to Title 10 of the Zoning Ordinance of the City Code regarding definitions of and types of commercial lodging facilities, including the regulation of short-term rentals and to allow for transient short-term rentals within the commercial zone, the highway commercial zone, and the central business district zone, <coughs> and provide clar clarifications of the same. Uh, the location is throughout the city. The recommended zone tax amendments would affect all those properties that are zoned, CBD, commercial and highway commercial. Uh, those maps are included in your staff report from uh, May 17th. And uh, regarding the May 17th meeting, this item was first considered by the commission, though we only had three members present at the time, on May 17th of this year. And the planning commission did consider staff's recommended ordinance regulating short-term rentals within these three commercial zone districts. The Commission did consider public comment and deliberated on the proposed draft ordinance, providing staff with some additional direction on uh, modifications uh, to be included in the draft ordinance as follows, basically directing staff to initiate those changes per your direction and come back uh, here today. So uh, there's one up, so I, I did these in bulleted forms. Uh, we updated section 10-4-20E2. And that was to require the responsible person or representative to be available on a 24-7 uh, basis and that that person uh, be available to be at the location on site within one hour. Uh, the second uh, bullet or request was include requirements for a host to post information for guests on high fire risk areas and how to sign up for the El Dorado County red, uh, Code Red and this provision has been added to section 10-4-20E6. Uh, third bullet, uh, require the fire official to be present for the annual inspections of units to make sure the defensible space ordinance is being maintained. And the reason for that is uh, under the permit, which would require annual renewal, not only will then uh, planning staff review, but will also then notify the fire district fire marshal so he could also do a review. So we added that in there. And then the last bullet is uh, not allow conversion of new mixed use developments uh, within the commercial zones to be used for short term rentals. So staff added, added this restriction, and this is 1 uh, 4 or 10-4-20C, 
and this restriction would be consistent with the intent of the mixed use provisions that were added to the commercial zone districts pursuant to ordinance number 1667 and that was provided in your staff report which was adopted by, by the city council on October 28th of 2014. And the purpose of that ordinance was to promote the development of employee housing and implement the housing element, the cycle five element, program number six, which was to facilitate housing for employees in accordance with the state's employee housing act. Um, so that's, so you can read, read that change basically. It was a very, very simple addition. And then lastly, staff on its own made an additional modification. When a question came up at our last meeting on an item regarding the code sections within the residential single family zone districts that basically allows for the renting of no more than one room. And so that's, that's been very confusing to staff and the public alike. So basically to give a little background, this is an archaic section, I think as I explained uh, at the last meeting. Uh, when, when codes, typically jurisdictions would attempt to regulate and restrict the use of single family dwelling units to families. The city can no longer define what a family is. And this is California, it doesn't apply to all, all 50 states in the union, but there are other states that also have their own you know, Supreme Court challenges to these kinds of restrictions. Mm -hmm. So there is nothing that would pro prohibit somebody from renting a room, or several rooms for that matter, that are unrelated. In other words, room, your roommates. Therefore, staff recommend deleting this unenforceable section from the single family residential zone. Really has no effect other than deleting something that we cannot enforce. Mm -hmm. We haven't been able to enforce since, I think, 1980. It was a case in Santa Barbara uh, where this came to light. California Supreme Court said you can, couldn't do that. So, in conclusion, uh, short-term rental use for transient accommodations within the Central Business District, the Commercial District, and the Highly Commercial Zone Districts may be considered commercial lodging facilities, but they're currently not defined as a hotel or motel use. It's currently defined by the zoning code. And hotels and motels are six units or more. They have different requirements under the building code. Um, so we wanted to accommodate this reduced unit scale, five or less individual units. Uh, close regulation of this type of, lot of lodging facility requires more defined regulation since these facilities typically do not have on-site management as a hotel and motel does and can become a nuisance of inconsiderate guests, and this is the word I used at our last meeting, run amok. Uh, the permitting process uh, through the recommended short-term rental permit would allow for a more clear set of operational standards. An annual review process would also allow for the review of the facility annually and non-renewal of a short-term rental determined to be a nuisance to the community. So with that, staff is recommending that the commission cons continue to consider uh, the request, staff's report, as well as any additional public comment in the public record and make a recommendation to the City Council amending Title 10 of the City Code that would add short-term rental uses within the Central Business District, the Commercial, and the Highway Commercial Zone District subject to the approval and issuance of short-term rental permit. That concludes staff's report. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Do any commissioners have questions for staff based on the report they received? I'm going to have a, a couple of questions, and forgive me because I wasn't here at sure. the last meeting, um, so some of these may have, may have been addressed. Oh, just to be clear, first and foremost, uh, all of the uh, the state residential single family uh, resident, all that's being excluded, right? You're not allowed to have short term rentals in those areas, is that correct? That is correct. Uh, these changes are only looking at those three commercial districts. It was the it was the direction of the council that we would we would examine those commercial districts that allow hotels and motels by right. Okay, that's what I thought. Uh, but what about if you have a guest house? Because every one of these mentions a guest house, right? Because that's how they're defined, I think. So if an individual has a guest house in these various residential, are they still prohibited from a short term rental? Yes. Okay. That's just uh, that's just for clarification. Um, 
I'm always reluctant to suggest language, particularly when I think a lawyer drafted something. But in the second to last whereas on page two, and I assume, I assume the, the, the ordinance that was at the front of the packet is for today, and the let yellow one was from last time, right? Yes. Okay, so that second whereas at the top of the page, the sentence, uh, the last sentence reads, because there is no possibility that the proposed ordinance may have a significant effect on the environment, it's exempt from CEQA, okay? Correct. That could be factual. I always get nervous when it says no possibility, just a suggestion. I'm not gonna ask for it in a motion, but just a suggestion staff can take back. Maybe you wanna say because there is no reasonable possibility, just to leave the door open. Um, and then, Ordinance may have a significant effect, uh, significant unmitigatable effect. So in other words, I guess what, what I thought, what I thought when I read this was, well, that's pretty absolute, and that if someone was going to challenge it, that might be a weak point for some of the challenges. So that was a comment. Yeah, staff could just add. You know, typically when you're looking at C, where you're looking at sort of a hierarchy, and so you know it's fairly reasonable. Typically, I think most of these cases you're going to be looking at a structure that's already developed and already there. And even if somebody were to develop a small structure, there are other sections of CEQA that that would fall under. But what we're trying to say is, is there's not going to be a significant impact on the environment. Sure. Like somebody building over a creek. That, that I agree with. But it said no possibility. When it says no possibility, again, yeah, just my little great flight. That's just a, that's just an observation. On page four, item D, permit required. Uh, this would be D4. And this deals with the inspection by city and Elgin County Fire Marshal. Perfectly reasonable, but are there any parameters uh, under which that happens? You know, if you have to give notice or what trigger, I, I, I presume a complaint can trigger it, probably, uh, an inspection, but there, is there anything else that would trigger it? What kind of parameters have to be given? How much advance notice or they can just show up at any time? And you follow what I'm saying? Well, if we do receive a complaint, like if the property isn't being well maintained, there's a fire hazard, the general public can make that file a complaint with our department, we'll investigate. But in, in, in your questions pertaining strictly to an annual review that we would do, just a matter of course of the permit, that's the responsibility of the permit holder. Well, that I understand, but it says, and be subject to site inspection. My, my question is, what are, are there any parameters around that? And I guess the language I'd be looking for, as specified in city code, whatever, or whatever procedures you have. Because it just says they can be subject to inspection, which I, I understand, but I'm just wondering if there are parameters for those inspections. Yeah, that'd be the two parameters. One, like I described complaint. earlier, complaint driven. Because okay. we we inspect properties for for complaints currently that are not short term rentals. But in this case, if they're under a permit, that permit is gonna require that the owner instigate an annual review. Mm -hmm. Oh, so so they can pre if, if under as, as part of annual renewal an inspection more than likely, but not automatically, but more than likely will happen. Certainly can have. We, we, we would like to do an annual review. Okay, of all that's all great. So that, that, have, I mean, that's that was the desire that was of the nice. commission for last year. And well. so that's, mm -hmm. that's, that language is in response to, I think this may have been added, this section D4 was added per commission deliberation. Okay. We felt that was important. Sure. And sense. again, ju just to finalize on, uh, on your question, Yes, when they come in, it'll it'll be in their permit that there'll be an annual inspection. Okay, there's, there's, okay, there's parameter there's parameter new, that's new. That's parameter process. I'm so, looking for. Yes. Okay. Um, then going down to the, and I believe under E2, this may have been added as part of deliberation, uh, the 24-7 availability and on site with one hour, one hour, right? I think, and, and I, I support that, but um, I was just wondering can be on site with one within one hour kind of s strikes me as kind of weak. <coughs> Excuse yes. me. Oh, oh, sorry. Okay, no bless you, my child. <laughs> <laughs> he's either really strongly <laughs> objecting to my opinion or he supports it. I'm not sure. Um, and can be on site within one hour. I'm just thinking some other language must be on site within one hour when requested or if needed. 
again, going back to parameters, right? I understand the intent of this, but to say and can be, uh, what, I'm not entirely sure what that means. Um, but I, I think the intent of this, correct me if I'm wrong, because this came up, I think, in your deliberation. Mm -hmm. You want, if somebody has this, hey, an obligate, and, and by the way, on that point, can they designate somebody? Because yeah. that would almost yeah. preclude them from going on. Yeah, I think I, I responsible person or their designee. Yeah, I think a responsible person could be someone who is not the property owner. Okay. So it's just a responsible <coughs> person. So I think. Oh, this okay. a responsible person. Okay, I read that correctly. Yeah, and then the intent I would say behind the request I had made for this was really to make sure that there's a local site okay. contact in the event that there's a problem or emergency, et cetera. Okay. Um, that we're not having, you know, somebody uh, venture capital firm from. No, I, 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 I support the <laughs> intent. Make sure yeah. that makes sense. I'm just wondering about the work can be on site with one one hour and the enforce. How do you enforce that? I, that's how I was kind of approaching it. So. Well, know. I think the thought too is if that if something happens and a person isn't on site within an hour, then their license is in jeopardy. Yeah. So they need to be responsible in thinking that through. Well, that's a good carrot. I would say, I mean, that, that's kind mm -hmm. of a stick for mm -hmm. it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I, I'll you know I'll just leave that as an observation. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, on the following page, e eight, I guess, noise. Um, excessive noise should be prohibited between the hours of 10 and 8, of course. Do we need to define this as in decibels or how it works, or is excessive noise, in, in terms of like our nuisance code, is it excessive noise? A nuisance true. It's, it's, like it's, it's a, that's a term of art. It doesn't have to be it's like a term of art. noise that extends beyond the property boundary. You don't have a noise meter or not okay. looking at getting a noise meter. I okay. think it's your typical nuisance complaint mm -hmm. that a neighbor would have if your neighbor is playing the stereo too loud because they have a party going on and they can't hear very well because of the drinking too much. Okay. And then the, my, my last question, just a general question. Has there been any opposition, any up to this that we know of? Just curious. If everybody is. I'm trying to think. We we have we did we had some. Well, if you recall, because you were involved in the when staff brought to the commission some changes to be made. We were asking the commission to adopt re a resolution modifying the, the special temporary use permit items, and we added first we added the short term rentals to the central business district. Yes. And then we also add, we're attempting to add it to the commercial. So the central business district sailed through, nobody appealed. But there was an appeal to, I'm sorry, it was the highway commercial. Yes. So there was an appeal that went to council, and then that's why we're here. Council then wanted staff to go do a little more thorough work. No, that I understand. But so is it, the public hasn't seen this yet? Aside from last or your last meeting and tonight, well, that's the only opposition. The opposition, I'll okay, just say exactly what it was. They felt that we were losing affordable housing, right? If we allow I recall the that. units in the highway commercial zone to change the short term rentals, okay, that's the opposition. So, when council goes to adopt this, they may or may not get opposition to it but at this level because we're simply recommending. Okay, thank you for the time and the indulgence. I have no other questions. <laughs> Any other commissioners have questions based on the report that we've seen? Yes, I also have some questions, and uh, I posed these to um, staff earlier today, and um, here and I had a, a long discussion. And I just want to bring these up, um, my questions up now, uh, not to uh, start a discussion at this point, but mostly uh, now that we have members of the public present, uh, want to raise these issues in case. Uh, there's something that uh, you feel you, you know, would like to comment on uh, in addition to whatever else brought you here tonight. Um, and what I'm trying to do is get clarification and a better understanding for myself and make sure also that we've considered uh, all the aspects and that we have a, uh, a robust and um, durable uh, ordinance uh, that we can pass on to the City Council for their consideration. Mm -hmm. So uh, my first question is under section two, the findings, and it is the, uh, the definition of short-term rental. Uh, in that uh, section two, one, uh, short-term uh, or vacation rental is defined as a single dwelling unit, uh, and you can read along, 
My concern is uh, the requirement for cooking um, facilities. In our definition of, of a short-term rental, we're requiring that, and then uh, further on, in, um, yes, and, and then on the next page under section three, when we uh, get into 10-1-4. So starting with our definition and then going down to um, the definition in section three below, uh, we're requiring a full kitchen. And uh, when I discussed this with Mr. Rebus, uh, he, uh, his concern here was that uh, a property owner might try to market and rent something that's really below standard, uh, that didn't have, that had simple, simple plumbing and, um, you know, a small space. And, um, you know, I appreciate that that would be the worst case scenario. But um, what I uh, would like to hear from other commissioners and the public is uh, the requirement for a full kitchen, whether we can um, have quality rentals uh, that serve the public and uh, take care of this uh, without that requirement. You know, in, we also say that SDRs are similar to motels and hotels, which typically, some do, but typically do not have, uh, you know, a full kitchen. They may offer a microwave um, and, and a small refrigerator. Um, so if we're saying on one hand that these are similar to motels and hotels, I want to be uh, clear and I want to uh, put in the public record as we deliberate, uh, you know, why we're making this requirement. Or if we decide, you know, perhaps we don't need it, uh, then make a, a suitable modification. Um, Mr. McKinney, so are you saying, other, um, sorry, just so I understand, are you interpreting cooking as meaning a full kitchen? If you look on, let's see. Yeah, There's the section. preamble, and then if you go to one, two, page three, section three, action, um, 10 4 10 1 4, definitions, and there's commercial lodging facilities, then breakfast, hotel, motel, and then the next one is short term rentals. In that text on the third line, uh, yeah. it says, and a full kitchen. That's and a, uh, a full kitchen is defined <laughs> elsewhere in our zoning code as having. You know, uh, I, I brought it along in case you want to look at it, but uh, basically it says a range or a stovetop and an oven. So um, I, I don't know that we, uh, I, I just want to be clear on what the requirement is for that definition. And I appreciate uh, where Mr. Rivas is uh, coming from. He wants us to have quality things, uh, not substandard things that are for rent. Uh, in my thinking, a kitchen is an amenity that you could advertise and you know charge more for it. Uh, it may not be necessary for everyone who comes in and just wants to stay a night or two in Placerville. You know they they plan on going to our restaurants. They they aren't planning on cooking, preparing meals, and then the short term rental. Um, so we can talk about this a little bit uh, more after we bring it back for deliberation. Again, I, I want to hear from the public and and everyone uh, so that I'm clear on on that requirement. Um, my other concern is 10-4-20C, uh, the prohibition of converting the long-term rentals in the mixed-use developments to short-term rentals, um, I find a little too restrictive. Now, I, I listened to the deliberations from the last meeting and I appreciate you know, the concern, and I, it's one of my own, um, but I also know the conditions change, and you know things are subject to amendment. And if, if conditions just uh, economic conditions change, that this can be brought back. Uh, the city council can uh, direct staff to amend things uh, as as we need. But at the outset, I, I, it's my intent to have a sense of a durable and and flexible um, ordinance that accommodates a, a wide range of uh, needs and also serves us in, uh, into the future. So my question, um, and this appear this is not uh, something that I'm clear on, uh, if we, if the commission uh, agrees that, you know, maybe we could have a little flexibility on this, uh, uh, an owner of a long-term rental that's in one of these mixed-use developments as described in the attachment uh, that you provided, uh, could, that owner comes before the plan commission and to request a site plan review and approval prior to 
having uh, the special temporary use permit issued on that. Is that, would that be a way for us to protect uh, the, the long-term uh, employee housing that uh, we're concerned about? Um, I, I'm trying to think what we can build into this to, to allow for that flexibility that uh, there is some sort of review of, um, of the conversion before we, uh, as opposed to just allowing for it. Well, that would be the prerogative of the, of the Planning Commission. This, this section was added in based on comments and the desire of the Commission to make this restriction, and mainly because in the attached uh, ordinance that the city adopted, I think, in 2014. That was to implement some state regulations where the city was required to try and facilitate employee housing. And so prior to that, we didn't really have mixed-use development. It was you're strictly commercial. So this was a way of allowing for mixed-use development where you could have residential units either below or above grade level to provide for employee housing. So that was very, very specific. So now we're saying we're going to somehow go against what the intent was of that original ordinance to make way for short-term rentals at the expense of possibly losing employee housing. But I would agree with what you said. I mean, you could certainly create a uh, review mechanism such as a site plan review. Typically, a site plan review is triggered when there's a change of occupancy, but I don't think there would be a change in occupancy from long-term rentals to a short-term rentals. Probably doesn't change occupancy at all. The, the so it wouldn't trigger anything, so we'd have to be very specific if that was the desire of the commission to have that review. The challenge would be the findings to grant it, right? To grant challenge would be the findings. Challenge would be the findings to grant the exception. I mean, I, 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 in general, I always like there to be an exception be, so we can be flexible because everything shouldn't be rubber stamped and the plaster mill can't be rubber stamped for a lot of reasons. Um, but I, I could just see the devil would be in the details on that one, but I understand what you're, you're saying. Yeah, because staff didn't originally have that restriction in there. Um, <clears throat> but I think it was astute of the of the Planning Commission during deliberations at our last meeting that that came up because that had slipped my mind about that ordinance uh, creating allowing for the mixed-use development for employee housing, because it is a severe shortage in this community. And part of the discussion around that, too, was to ensure that people aren't going and getting credits for developing housing, only to turn around and turn them into short-term rentals, rather than what they're intended to and possibly being rewarded for doing uh, by building. Well, uh -huh. I mean, nothing would preclude the uh, issue of developing an exception mechanism from being brought up at a later date. So if this quote unquote restrictive language was left in here, that's okay. It, uh, uh, an exception mechanism could be developed at a later time, right? Doesn't have to be developed now. If you have this restriction that says this, you cannot convert, you know, uh, units constructed pursuant to mixed use provisions for the employee housing, the concept that we were thinking about, right? So this is a restriction. But at some later date and time, a, a mechanism to grant an exception could be created and then brought to us for approval and that sort of thing, right? True. Yeah, that could be done. In, in so this is not an absolute <coughs> both done deal. The ordinance is never absolute. Okay. Right. <laughs> ordinance has changed. <laughs> <laughs> like the wind, like the blowing winds of the sea. <laughs> Well, times change. <laughs> Talking about okay. um, adding a requirement to bring it before the Planning Commission, what's the cost on a special use permit to have it seen to, to come before the Planning Commission? It usually depends upon the environmental review, but um, I don't have my fee schedule with me, but I'm trying to take up a site plan review. I think it's, God, it's $500, I think. Okay. So, and the reason I ask that is, are we setting ourselves up in the position that somebody looks at that and says, I've got to, I've got to put out an extra $500 to go and get this. Well, forget that noise. I'm just going to do it on the sly and see if anybody ever catches me. And so then we don't even know who's doing this. And that, that's why I'm afraid of putting that extra step in there of, of a review 
Um, when somebody could walk into the desk and say, "Okay, I've got this, I've got this room, but my this is business, I've got a, I've got a microwave, I've got a sink, I've got a refrigerator, I've got a, a bathroom, and I'd like to rent it out." Versus coming to the planning commission and spending that extra five hundred dollars, uh, I would not be in favor of that. Well, they would have to apply to us if they had that. They'd have to apply to us even without this provision, they'd have to apply to us to use that their their property in this manner. So if they choose not to do it, then uh, they're, I don't trust them anyway, I guess. For, for yeah, sometimes it's difficult because I mean, there's, you know, and I've seen it in my career whenever there's a, a big spike in the cost of housing. There's a lot of um, house flipping that's going on, a lot of work done without permits. So we're inundated with a lot of permit work. People that we dealt with entire, an entire house was built without a permit, believe it or not. So I mean, it, it happens. A lot of work is done without permits. So, you know, we do the best we can to police and be aware of what's happening. Our code enforcement staff, they do check the internet sites for, you know, illegal or unpermitted short-term rentals and we, from time to time we capture them and stop them. So it's it's difficult really to have that mindset where you are you don't want to regulate something in a certain way because then people are going to do it on the sly. Yeah. I think it happens a lot anyway so yeah. my recommendation is not to really look in that direction. Sometimes you do. I'll give you an example. And water heaters is one. You know, water heaters, the cost of a permit for water heater is set very, very low intentionally because we want people to come in and get a permit for a water heater because there's a lot of new requirements on the building code. We want the resident to put them in correctly and hopefully be done by a licensed contractor rather than one that's, well, I'm just going to put this in myself, not get a permit, and then something happens in the future. So that's a situation where, yeah, we want to try and reduce unpermitted work with regards to water heaters, so we set the permit extremely low, so it's not an impediment to somebody mm -hmm. coming in and getting the permit, so. Okay. So at this time, if you guys are okay, can I move to the public comment and come back to the discussion on these topics? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and do that. So I'm gonna open the public comment on this topic. Members of the public who wish to address the commission can spend up to three minutes talking about this, um, this ordinance, okay? Do any members of the public wish to approach the commission? I'll go first. And okay, first. great. Yeah. <laughs> We're just standing and talking today. We're just winging it. <laughs> I want to say thank you. Go thank ahead. you for your very thoughtful approach um, to the short-term rentals and possible. And I do have a suggestion. So um, keeping the short-term rental city code simple, and um, I actually suggest that you consider not limiting them to the commercial zones. When I looked at the Sacramento one, I couldn't see it limited to commercial. And the reason I say that, which <laughs> and it sounds a bit crazy coming from me, but it's um, I think if we focused on permitting the current Airbnbs, it would actually uh, uh, the reason why I say that is if we permit the 16 that I found when I looked the other day, I, it, it would not lower the housing stock further as these dwellings are already not available for long-term rentals due to their current Airbnb use. And if new short-term uh, rental owners have to get permits and the illegal ones continue to operate, it makes it unfair to the law-abiding citizens who are being compliant. And um, turning a blind eye kind of comes, gives the admission of, of giving permission. So, like I said, I, I just went to Airbnb and 16 classable city properties came up. And um, I, I tried to focus them all as, you know, uh, individual <sighs> properties versus, um, you know, so the secret garden, entire guest suite, hot tub, you know, as you know, many, many of those. So, I, I, I know short term rentals are here to stay, and, and I really thank you for trying to organize them uh, to have the least negative impact on our city. But I think if we start with the current ones, it would be dealing with reality because they're there. <laughs> Fine, thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much for your comments. Any other members of the public wish to address the commission? Go ahead, Dave. Either one of us. Um, I just had just a couple things, a couple quick. 
quick pick comments. Um, I'm, my name is David Ross. I live in Placerville. I have the, the one um, short-term rent, short rental uh, project that's done in front of you guys a couple times. Um, the one thing about the fire inspection and those type of inspections, like our property is inspected by the fire department uh, state mandated because it's three or more units. So it's state mandated, mandated every year. Um, so we've had that two years in a row so, so far. Um, the one concern I had was with the, the paved parking requirement. Um, a lot of these are residences and have been residences for a long time. Um, if you're looking at the occupancy of, of what they were as a, a re residence um, and what they're going to be now as a short-term rental, um, I would argue that there's going to be even less traffic in um, going in and out of the of the unit residence, whatever, um, than there than there was previously. Um, my my property specifically has been there for over eight years. Um, there's never been paved parking. There's not paved driveway coming in. Um, so um, I don't know what just having a large paved area is gonna. Um, going to do for, for anyone. It's not, it's not really going to help anything. It's going to create more runoff and drainage right into the, the creek there. Um, and I think other other um, short-term rentals is going to affect them in, in a similar way. I just don't know if that's a really necessary requirement. Um, and then the other thing, I just I guess wanted clarification on if uh, a single family residence, so they no longer can rent out um, just a room in their home because I just saw that that was lined out um, and I didn't understand if that was a if that wasn't going to be a possibility anymore um, and just as we all know the home prices and our in Postville have gone up almost 30 percent this year maybe maybe over 30 percent now um, I just I don't I no longer do this but when I was in college like the first house that I bought I always had a room rented out um, it was a good way to help me be able to afford the house um, I feel like if that's taken away. I know there's other people in our community that won't necessarily be able to afford to live here if if they're not allowed um, to rent out the, a room in their house, even if it's just on a short-term basis and not permanently um, or 30 days or more, which is more cumbersome and to to the homeowner. Um, I think that, that was it. Great. If I may, or did you want to go ahead and talk, and then I'll we can answer. I think the question. Go ahead and answer room. him, and then I'll take my turn. I think Mr. Ravas had touched on it, but I think you might not have quite yeah. been here yet, that the room rental is unregulatable because we can't define who. Can you restate the family? Sure. Yeah, I'm sorry. You said it was Yeah, unfortunately, uh, uh, David, you weren't here when we discussed that that particular part of the code. Um, it It's caused a lot of confusion, both to, to staff and the public. Like, what does that mean? You can only rent one room. So if you have a four bedroom house that you own, you can only rent out one room. Well, no, under under a court case back in 1980 in Santa Barbara, uh, basically the, the city cannot define a family. A lot of those regulations were to maintain the integrity of a single family home. I've studied the history of that. That's back when I was in school. I remember that case, discussing that case. And, um, it was, it was to preserve the integrity of a single family dwelling in the neighborhoods they wanted families, not, to, not cohabitation, like, you know, you get all the different period of uh, different things. And so, um, generally speaking, a lot of codes would say, yeah, you can rent one room out to a non-related person. It was to define the family. And so, as you said, like when you were in school, like when I was in school in Santa Barbara, where it was very expensive, even way back then, uh, yeah, I had a lot of roommates, and removing that doesn't do anything other than they can rent as many rooms as they want. So the city would still have the option of regulating the occupancy of a single family dwelling based on building code requirements, but not based on um, you know, relationships or anything of that nature. You can rent out the, all the rooms and have roommates. That's all it does. It's an archaic section of the code that needs to come out. It came out at, at the, with the Planning Commission at the last meeting. And so, you know what? I'm just going to recommend that we strike that out. It doesn't affect this this issue, per se, short-term rentals at all. Mm -hmm. So, Madam Chair, this is probably out of order, and I can be called out of order, but 
I don't understand this issue. So at the end of the ordinance, there's the cross out of renting of not more than one room. Okay, in, in all of those. Okay. And so. what we're saying is that we're not able to regulate that. We can't say you can only rent one room in your four bedroom house. Okay, but but there, I think a distinction is being made. This is my confusion. I think a distinction is being made, even if it's not overtly stated, between short term rentals which are like Airbnbs and weekends versus you're getting a roommate in college. You you don't want rapid turnaround, right? You, you want to get somebody in that's going to stay. You want some stability, I think. Are we making a distinction between those? No. We aren't. So I, I'm con so in the short, short term rentals are defined. We, we, we define that in the code and that's 30 days or less. Or less. Okay, and so that I use is that permitted section. That use is permitted in all of the residential real estate. I thought no. Well, we're See, doing, we're moving, we're removing a restriction, the renting of one room. It has nothing to do with oh, you're allowed to do a short-term rental. The short-term rentals is defined. So you can't do a short-term rental in a single-family home. You okay. can't do it now. So we can't do a short-term rental in a single-family home. And the way this was, the way this was written, this was limiting you to for long-term rental yes mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so exactly. it was inconsistent with the court case yes, yes. okay thank you for that clarification yes. yes. I, was yeah. your question. I was lost not I was exactly. really yeah. lost. It, it is a past it has been people okay. are starting to look at that oh maybe this is a way for a short term uh, rental. okay i understand when you really so much. To do with short -term. okay thank you so much sorry okay. no i thought that's okay. what you're asking about the removal of the yeah, yeah, no, it was. Uh, so just, just to clarify, you so you can use like a marketing platform like Airbnb to rent out a room in your house, or you cannot? It can't you cannot short rent term. Uh, a room in your single family home in a residential, residential. zone for short term rental. Okay. But you can use a platform to rent it out long term. And it's more than one room. You're not restricted to one room. Mm -hmm. and that's what this is. To, it's restricted to one room right now and it's unenforceable. Mm -hmm. So staff wants it removed. It has to be for longer than 30 days, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It has to be longer for 30 days. In a residential district. Yes. All right. Okay, so go ahead. Did you want to speak on I, public comment? Well, the first thing I want to do is thank you guys because you're awesome. Um, I, I, I think of myself as special because I have this place and it's great and it's special and on a case by case basis, there will be a lot of real easy decisions to make. You guys are trying to put together something that's going to cover every case, every scenario, from now until the next person jumps up and down and gets excited. And I get hats off. I, I, you're amazing. Um, that said, I wanted to bring up something where I raised my hand last week <laughs> um, that Commissioner Gothberg said, and one of them one of the comments that you made was something about people buying the, you know, that the, the people who buy are aware of what they're, what's kosher and what's not kosher. And I have to say for myself, I was pretty naive. We bought the Blue Belt building 30 plus years ago and I just am fat, dumb and happy. I was involved in the Carry House, thought that when we were full, oh gee, I wish I could rent out one of the rooms upstairs because we have people that are snowed out, you know, and they can't get to Tahoe and the highway's closed and we've no place. And if it were me, I'd put them up in my living room because that's who I am. And then we have people like Dave who did buy a piece of property specifically because it specifically was zoned specifically for the purpose for which he wanted to use it and then he came up against people who weren't happy. But I think that that concept of, of people buying property and being aware is going gonna, is gonna to handle that mixed use to remain mixed use issue. I think that was you that brought that up? Anyway, no, I, um, I didn't. Okay, no, anyway, if it's mixed use and you're buying it as mixed use and the mixed use is based on something that was written that apparently somebody gets bonus points for putting in housing for their employees, that then they know 
and I'm sorry your wife isn't here, but it should be incumbent upon realtors to say, this is what mixed use is, this is what mixed use is based on, and if you think that you're going to, you know, put in something entirely different, think again, this is what it's for. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, but that said, things like evacuation routes and things like having somebody on call, um, those are wonderful additions to this. And I think they're appropriate so that you're right, we don't have, you know, somebody LLC out of New York buying up properties all over just because they can rent them out. Mm -hmm. And um, and that was, I think that was all I was going to say. Anyway, thank you for the work that you do. Good. Thank you very much. Appreciate your comments. Are there any other members of the public who wish to address the commission on this topic? Seeing none, I will go ahead and close the public comment portion of this hearing or of this review and bring it back to the commission for any further discussion and action. Um, I will say that I reached out to Pierre around the kitchen today as well um, and had a question around it and we discussed the fact that there is a definition, which I understand you still might have questions around, so we can kind of explore that of a full kitchen in the zoning code which would be pointed to if an application came with a question around if their kitchen was sufficient. Um, I sort of found that to be okay, but I understand where you're coming from around whether or not that is a fully requirement. I do think um, I tend to fall in, in the category of wanting this to be, allow it and to be reasonable for people, but also to have um, the requirements that allow to have a certain standard um, within the community. Um, so I don't know, I'd, I'd be open to the kitchen discussion, but just to say that that came up on my radar as well, and I think it needs to either be exactly what's pointed to in the code or defined in there. Um, I was satisfied with pointing it to it in the code, but the, the topic around that. Chair Leopard, yeah. staff could just mm -hmm. add a few comments to that, mm -hmm. you know, what was staff's thinking. Yeah. Uh, first, um, these short-term rentals are not hotels, they're not motels, mm -hmm. they're less than six, so there's no on-site management, there's no, you know, these are standalone single-family units per the building code. And so mm -hmm. we, we didn't want to see somebody finding a closet that happened to have plumbing and, and a toilet facility mm -hmm. in it and all of a sudden they think they can just put a hot plate and boom, they got a short-term rental. Mm -hmm. In other words, a, a hotel room, just a single hotel room all by itself on the lot or, or within a building. That's not what we're looking, that's not what the short-term rental is really supposed to be, mm -hmm. and so that's why it's, it's different. And so, and again, a short-term rental, we wanted to to meet the minimum building code requirements of a dwelling unit. It can be very, very small, mm -hmm. but it needs to comply with being categorized as a dwelling unit, not a hotel room. With the amenities. Right. Yeah. yeah. If they want to go to mm -hmm. you know six or more, well, then they're hotel motel, and mm -hmm. it's sort of a different set of requirements. Like somebody could do that. We don't want just individual now just hotel rooms mm -hmm. without the kitchen. Which, yeah, well, I, I, I agree that the reference to the city code as what defines a full kitchen, I was satisfied with that. Yeah, we talked about that code. earlier. There isn't any the building code that mm -hmm. really addresses it's a hot there. plate and a microwave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I find that very, very interesting and illuminating, frankly, because I was really kind of uh, sympathetic to what Christine King was saying. I would prefer to have the market drive it, but as you describe it, that kind of makes some sense to me. Actually, my concern around that whole topic is in, in cooking versus whatever. I'm more concerned about the food waste as well, and and I and, and so I would say where you have cooking, I would say including food waste disposal because um, we, I guess we're if we're saying full kitchen is implied, so that's already going to be covered, right? So I have to worry about it. So if we Leave it the way it is, and a full kitchen is going to be the standard. Mm -hmm. All right, so we don't have to worry about it. As reference, but if we code. didn't, if we don't go, if for whatever reason this commission decides it doesn't want to go to full kitchen requirement, I think food sanitation, food disposal would be really important because that gets to the the hot plate and the microwave, 
what do you do with the leftover stuff, right? That's kind of yeah, I could probably answer that in brief. I don't want to get too much into that side of it, but under um, AB 1383, that's a new state regulation that's being oh. over, <laughs> overseen by Calvary Cycle, and so yeah, it's yeah, part yeah. of what our department does. We implement the new regulations. Uh, the collection and recycling of food waste is going to be mandatory mm -hmm. for every business and every resident in the city of Placerville. So I think that's, it'll be covered. I'm at a garbage area. disposal, I guess is where I was going. I, I didn't mean necessarily the, the third bin or whatever. I was thinking about the garbage disposal as part of the, the cooking arrangement, but it's, I think that's already covered. Under the definition of a full yeah, kitchen, we have a specific full full definition mm -hmm. in our zoning code of what a, a kitchen, a full mm -hmm. kitchen is, and it doesn't include that. So, um, garbage disposal is not included. In that. Yeah, yeah. It should it be? Mm -hmm. I hate to, I hate yeah. to get I that much, but I mean, yeah. Yeah. okay, but yeah. if, otherwise, all right. Yeah, yeah, and I guess I would say also I, I'm sort of in the favor of keeping okay. it with the full kitchen because we do have a definition in our code of mm -hmm. what that means, um, so it makes it very clear. And I'm also concerned as staff is about people converting closets or other things that are really not intended <laughs> um, to be dwelling units. Mm -hmm. so. All right, so uh, this Good enough for now I'm wondering awesome. what kind of um, flexibility staff has. Uh, suppose someone comes to you, suppose we, we decide, okay, a kitchen isn't necessary. It's, a, it's an amenity that can be offered, um, and so that's an upgrade. What discretion does staff have if they come and they've got they've got a, the closet with um, um, running water? Do you can do you have if we don't require it to meet this uh, definition of a dwelling unit? If we change our base definition and then an application comes to development services that is just as you described something that's really not appropriate. Can you deny their application, or yes, if can. they're meeting? So we have we have the protection against that worst case scenario because of the discretion and development services. Well, it's like I said earlier. You know, we've seen an entire house built without a permit. So it's not to say somebody could. Right. We're getting that all the time. Right, but we're assuming someone who's going to go if through the permitting process. Somebody's going to rules. They're going to come in. They're going to submit a building permit application, and we're going to deny it because they're their permit is not going to show a full dwelling unit meeting the building code. I guess that's where I'm not making the, uh, seeing the nexus. Um, to me, it's uh, discretionary to uh, require it to meet the standard of a dwelling unit. Uh, and that's what I don't get. Why, why does it have to meet uh, this dwelling unit definition to have uh, a full kitchen if we have the protection when they come for a permit, that it is suitable. Say, it does look a lot like a, a basic motel room with, uh, you know, maybe not even uh, not even a microwave. But it is large, you can accommodate a couple of people overnight. I, I'm trying to uh, ensure, you know, that we're providing what, you know, the public wants uh, or what a, a property owner would like to market um, as long as it's, it's habitable. To me, habitable doesn't, doesn't mean that you have to be able to cook a meal in it. Um, I think, you know, we, we call these similar to motels and hotels. So uh, why the requirement for the kitchen? I, I, again, I just want to make sure I understand the, the legal uh, definition uh, or requirement, and then what flexibility we might be able to have to change the base definition. Well, there's no, staff is not, uh Staff is not suggesting any flexibility. We're basically looking at what is a short-term rental. A short-term rental is a dwelling unit that's rented 30 days or less. We don't want to create individual hotel rooms throughout In the city. Single. Because it's a, then a hotel room. It's not a really attached to a hotel or a motel. Mm -hmm. that's, the diff that, that's a key difference. Mm -hmm. I think the activity, like if, I, if I can bring the Nexus Commissioner to me, I think staff in the report made the observation that short-term rentals, the activity of a short-term rental, providing lodging in a commercial business district or highway commercial, is very similar from motel lodging, right? But that's, the activity is pretty much the same. It's commercial it's, lodging. It's commercial lodging. But short-term rentals are not 
motels, mm -hmm. and the staff, I think staff, what staff is putting forth is a standard for what short-term rentals should, should be. Mm -hmm. and, and I, so I think that, that might be it. And, and I, I'll go on record, I, I, I support the staff's direction on this, I think. And I'll go ahead and give another perspective, too. This is something that um, back when um, our Andrew Payne, our city planner, <coughs> got out a really good observation. I think when we were we were discussing this earlier, and that's that a lot of times you have over over time you'll have areas that are rezoned commercial that were once residential, and so the city creates these legal non-conforming use. That's what it's called. You have a single-family home in a commercial zone that was established long before it became commercial. That's a legal non-conforming use. Mm -hmm. You couldn't come in and pull a building permit to build a house there. Mm -hmm. You could come in now and build a house there as a short-term rental. Right. But not a single standalone hotel room. Mm -hmm. right. We want a full standalone vacation rental that somebody has full amenities to be able to stay there, you know, up to 30 days. They could actually probably stay there longer, but it's meant for 30 days if it's in a commercial zone. So I think that's the key difference. Yeah, um, I, I get that. Um, but we're also hinting this on, uh, we've had a couple of allocations come to the commission for new hotel space. And as we stand, you know, tonight, and we don't have any more hotel rooms today than we did, you know, a, a year ago. And I see this as a way for Placerville to provide um, that very short term rental of, of a night or two. And so when I think about that, I, you know, I, I think that uh, the proposals that have come before us, they will follow through and in uh, sometime in hopefully near future, there will be a larger uh, availability of the standard, what you think of as a hotel or motel room. But we don't have that today. So that's why I wanted the commissioners to think about the flexibility of a totally adequate overnight stay without the uh, requirement of a full kitchen. So that's um, that's really what I was thinking of, uh, is to allow the, the most number of property owners who have suitable rooms to, you know, uh, take advantage of this new ordinance and uh, provide uh, places to stay for people traveling through uh, and who maybe don't want to get them in. And the other thing um, that I thought about was that when we presented this and, and when uh, we looked at the very first application uh, above the bookery, that's a very constrained space. And, um, you know, there may be other places that are perfectly suitable, but it's going to be, they're going to be hard pressed to get a full, um, as, as we call in, in other definition, it is a, a range or uh, an oven and, um, and a, some sort of, uh, what is it, stovetop and an oven two separate things. Um, so I don't want to, you know, uh, shut those kinds of places out uh, by insisting that we have to uh, have the full kitchen. So that's, um, I'm just going to, um, uh, you know, I can sense that I don't have support for this, but um, to just kind of wrap it up, that's what I was thinking of. Um, because I, I, we've heard this complaint before, there aren't enough places to stay in Placerville, and uh, I'm trying to maximize that for us. Uh, just one more comment from me anyway, on that, uh, Commissioner. And, and again, very compelling uh, rationale I think you have for this. And it's like, I see where she's going with this, and let the, you know, kind of let, let the market drive what the quality of amenity is. But then you met, you said something, and I can't, I won't be able to paraphrase it exactly. But basically, it was something along the line that it could be something fairly simple. And what, again, what flashed in my mind, I think, is what staff is, is kind of concerned about is, you know, and I mentioned it here under my breath, Harry Potter under the stair with, the, you know, running water and a hot plate. And, and I think staff is really trying to set a standard because I think what happens is we want to discourage people who have possibly a closet or a little space from thinking they could do this. And so, we, we do want to set a standard for it. And so that, at the end of the day, I think that's why the, the, the full kitchen, I think, is, is probably the best way to go. Well, you know, I, um, I totally agree with that. And I don't want, I think we would get a terrible reputation if that's what was available. But I also am assured that, you know, staff has um, the discretion to not 
you, you aren't required to allow a permit for that particular situation. So, you know, I really think that uh, our reputation and the consumers actually are protected um, because these places are going to be inspected annually and uh, annually, and uh, they have to reapply for their special temporary use permit. So, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I have full confidence that, uh, you know, these, these will be um, habitable structures. Uh, actually, quite can be quite nice depending on what the, the owner wants to do with them. But um, certainly not a danger. Not just uh, something very basic. But um, you know, I, I, I hear where you're, uh, the rest of you are coming from. So uh, thanks for that. Thanks for considering it. Absolutely. And I think too, um, you know, sometimes starting off, as Pierre said, it's a living document. So maybe we have a full kitchen, and if we are just bashing our head against these full kitchens, then maybe we can really look at that. But mm -hmm. I think starting off with a high level of expectation around what should be provided within these zones in order to kind of manage it and see how it flushes out would be my inclination around it. Um, yeah. Well, I'm uh, mm -hmm. on a completely different topic. Uh, one of the members of the public mentioned something about a paving requirement. Mm -hmm. And I haven't yeah, found a question. paving requirement in here anywhere except perhaps a, an oblique reference via the California building code for paying guests. So Is there a Section E, Development and Operational show Standards? Me, okay. E4, um, uh, page 4, it's kind of light. Note yeah, okay, I see where it discusses uh, maximum occupation of parking. Where's the paving part? Uh, it, the number of paved parking spaces on the short-term rental property are shown in sec table one. So, okay. So uh, it's paved uh, twice uh, there. Okay, so is, so to staff then, it, is paved meaning absolute to standard paving or is decomposed ground? I mean, it, are we really talking about, or are we talking about simply mark delineated spaces? Where Instead of paved, we need commercial zones, we're talking about pavement. So that's right. We're this this is zones. this is mm -hmm. yeah this this okay. is residential where pay, pavement is not required. Okay. So in commercial zones, you're required to have paved parking. And so if there's yeah. a change in occupancy, you're going to have to provide paving. That is in other sections of the city code. Sure. City okay. code requires pavement in commercial. It's okay. Just that simple. Mm -hmm. Now uh, this wouldn't change those other. Codes. Okay, I agree. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with that. Now to the extent that uh, the concern for for runoff and impervious pavement. Uh, and I share that concern. Nothing precludes an applicant from using in, uh, pervious types of paving materials. And we've had presentations on mm -hmm. that to help prevent the runoff mm -hmm. uh, concern. But you're right, it is the, I forgot this is a commercial that makes pervious things. Yeah, and, and um, Commissioner Friend, you've been on, on here a long time. You probably recall <laughs> it's quite some time ago and we did some revisions to our development guide that added, I'm trying to remember the name of the actual program, but where we looked at facilitating bioswales, yeah. um, impervious surfaces, pavement types, to be able to absorb the water to yeah. reduce runoff. Yep. And it went through this commission and it's in our development guide so that there's a lot of different options. But when you pave, you know, it's not that you just haphazardly pave without looking at the drainage. No, sure, of course. And again, I forgot this was a commercial. So. But thank you for touching on that because I did want to touch on that that comment as well. Um, does anyone else have any either discussion, changes, proposals, motions, anything there for for this? I think this is a great, great attempt at this. I mean, I really do. I think this is this is strong work. I agree, and I, I also think with the public comment at the last um, meeting, with, of which there was a lot, which was really insightful in, on both sides, um, pro and, and not, um, I thought that this, when I reread it this time, especially after reflecting on that last meeting, I felt like it was a really good, strong um, ordinance that really lines out some things that we expect, but also, again, if we start facing things and, and have issues, we can always come back and visit it. But I, I certainly think that this is good. And, and thank you for taking the time to write this, because I do think it's important to have um, something in writing that, that at least outlines what, we, what we're what we saying now, you know? And I think that's really good. So thank you for all of your hard work on this. 
There's something a little bit comical to me on this page of looking at four people in a studio apartment and then seeing excessive noise requirement down below. There's, there's four really quiet people out there in the world. <laughs> um, in the <a> studio? <laughs> <laughs> so, on this one, Pierre, do we need a motion to adopt it? To forward it to the city council? Uh, no, you, you don't have to. Okay, so it's just... We're recommending you give, you've given our insight. You're you making the recommendation. From what I hear, we're not the council to consider this, these changes to the language today. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so I, unless you want to just do it by affirmation, I think we are making a motion. Oh yeah. To re we have to make a motion to recommend this to council. Okay. Good. Thank I, you. So we do need. And I move. I, oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I misunderstood your question. I would I make that motion. Okay. Great. That we that we move the uh, the ordinance as uh, presented this evening. Uh, by staff, I don't believe we've made any changes to it, right? No. So I, I, that we move the ordinance uh, uh, as uh, prepared by staff uh, for this date uh, to the city council for consideration and adoption in, in the county's ordinance. Okay, great. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, thank you, Mr. Voss. Could you call roll? Yes. Discussion amongst. Oh. Any discussion? Any further comments? Okay. okay. Uh, Commissioner Friend. Aye. Vice Chair Gopper? Aye. Commissioner Keeney? Aye. Uh, Chair Leppard? Aye. Commissioner Lewis? Aye. Okay, so you. the Commission has recommended that this ordinance be forwarded to the City Council for review and adoption. And then that'll have its own public hearing uh, for, for that whole process if people will be able to comment on it again. Then. It sure will. And since it's an ordinance, there will be an introduction of the ordinance. Yeah. And two readings, maybe? Product. Two readings. Yeah. Yeah, always two readings. And then, even after it gets adopted, it doesn't become an effective until 30 days after that adoption. Yeah, okay. I, again, I think it's really strong work. Good. And thank you to the public for coming, giving your insight, your input, and your experience. It's really do appreciate it, and it's very helpful. Um, okay, so now we're going to move on to... Sure, Weber, could staff ask for five minutes? Yes, yes. It's going to be five minutes late, so we'll come back at 7.25. All right, so we are going to go ahead and reconvene the June 7th Planning Commission meeting. And we're going to move to our item 12, which is our new business. And the first thing we are going to do is item 12.1, the election of officers for 2022 or the remainder of 2022. Since all five of us are here today, we are able to move forward with this item. Um, I haven't done this before, <laughs> so do I ask for a nomination? So, is it? <laughs> yeah, my, my recollection is uh -huh. you would ask for nominations for, for chair, and then we would do the same then for vice chair. Okay, so at this point, before we do that, I want needs. to thank you for your excellent service and extra service. You've done um, well above and beyond. Uh, your March 1st deadline. Thank you for doing so. I was going to start calling myself Queen Amy, but uh, you know, I will I will relinquish the position. <laughs> no, 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 let's not get too carried away. We don't know what's going to happen well, yet. You know, the carrot first. Always with the carrot. I will say, yes, I will say, the, uh, so I will entertain at this point a, a suggestion for the chair for the remainder of the 2022 period. Move Commissioner Gottberg as chair, Commissioner. Uh, list as vice chair. Okay, so we have a motion or a suggestion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and move nominations be closed. I uh, okay. uh, would like to have some discussion. Uh, <laughs> Mr. List, are you willing to serve as vice chair? I, and yeah. Okay, I was wondering, I can't remember the turn, and uh, Commissioner Fred has conveniently, you know, closed off, uh, tried to close off discussion. So, uh, I, I, I'd like to know from He's got that <laughs> Quite frankly, John, I, I, I think it's Michael's turn. But it is? The vice chair? I can't when, remember when you when were the chair or vice chair, Michael, uh, but I remember that uh, John, I think John has served. He hasn't been chair, time. though. I'm just yeah. kidding. Yeah. He was last year. I did the year we were at home. In COVID. Oh, uh, COVID. Mm -hmm. Right. Point of order. I think we ought to do chair first. So one at a time. Okay. Yes. So I have a uh, suggestion for Vice Chair Gottberg to move to Chair Gottberg. To and who made the motion that was uh, Mr. Friend? Friend. Right. Friend. You have a second? I'll make a second. Then. Okay. Second. Um, all in favor of Commissioner Vice Chair Gottberg becoming Chair um, Gottberg? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. 
you're, you're for? <laughs> no. You say no? You're opposing no. her appointment. Because, just because. No. I guess what you just said. Aside she said opposed and I said I. Oh, okay, so we have one opposed. To, yeah. Oh, okay. Got it. So There's got to be one opposed up here somewhere. <laughs> So we have four in favor and one opposed to Commissioner Gar Vice Chair Gofford becoming uh, chair for the remainder of the 2022 period. Does that mean that it passes? Yes. Okay, good. So <laughs> congratulations, you will be chair for the remainder of the 2022 period. Um, I'll now entertain suggestions for vice chair for the remainder of the 2022 term. Well, just for the uh, sake of argument, I'll... Uh, put in a competing motion to uh, nominate Michael Friend as vice chair for uh, 2022, just I to make things difficult. I would second that, if you're open to it. You haven't been in, the, in a leadership position since I've been on it. <laughs> Is that? Fair enough. No, you have. You did one year. No, I don't, I don't know that I have. I, I deliberately have not because of my tenure, so. Would Maybe you I have, I forget. Yeah, you have. Okay. Oh, you know, my first, I think, yeah, maybe one year I was chair. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think I've been chair. Okay. Would you, are you amenable to being vice chair no, for I'm the remainder of the period? Yeah, no problem. <laughs> okay. And, uh, Mr. Listow, do you have a burning desire to be vice chair? And, uh, oh, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 well, I'm happy to let him serve. Okay. Sort of so we have, <laughs> you're okay either way. So we have a first from Commissioner Keeney and a second from myself to uh, elect Commissioner Friend as Vice Chair for the remainder of the 2022 term. All of those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Okay. Four ayes and one yourself. no <laughs> means that Vice, uh, Commissioner Friend is now Vice Chair Friend for the remainder of the 2022 aye. term. Congratulations to our new officers. Yes, Enjoy whoever wants my torn up script from the last year and a half. You're welcome to it. Um, okay, so let's move to our final item for tonight, which is item 12.2, the 2021 Housing Element Annual Progress Report for Cycle 5. Mr. Ravos, you have the report. Uh, thank you, Chair Lepper, mm -hmm. <coughs> members of the commission. Um, this is a requirement of the state uh, housing and community development that we prepare a annual progress report on our housing element. And I apologize, it is sometimes very difficult to read because it's a, it's a number of tables that would stretch the length of this table. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I had some good discussions with um, Chair Lepper earlier on this. And so just for clarification, I'm just, just right from the start, she made some very, very good observations. Um, why is Cubby Drive listed in this because the permit was issued in 2019. Simple answer, that project that was a very large custom home, took a long time to build. Anything on here meant that it was either uh, issued or final in 2021. So even though the permit was issued in 2019, it wasn't final until 2021, therefore it's on the list. Another good question was in regards to um, table A2, why do we have the number of 17, and then we also have the number 11, and then we have the number of 7? What do those <laughs> numbers mean with respect to each other? So <clears throat> we had 17 dwelling units that were issued and or final in 2021. So a total of 17 in that category. Of those, 11 were issued permits and final in 2021, okay? So we have 11 in all of 2021. This is where the little complication comes in. The cycle five housing element that's, that just ended, it ended on March the 31st. It was from 2013 through 2021. The new housing element that we just adopted is 2021 through 2029, beginning in April. So ACD has this cutoff, and a lot of the tables are done automatically by ACD. We don't manipulate everything and populates itself. So out of those 11, seven of which were final after March 31st, 2021. 
So that's why there's a little bit of, I can see somebody reading that and becoming confused, but that's the way HCD does it, to have that cut off. So anyways, not a whole lot of uh, units were developed. None were developed in the low and very low income. We're hoping that some of our larger apartment complexes that are moving forward may change that, such as the Plastical Armory, mm -hmm. such as the affordable housing project we're proposing on Middletown and Cold Springs, and then the other one being proposed on Mallard by Winesap and, and um, uh, McIntosh laying there, up there on that path. That'll be also a, an affordable housing project. And they're all, they all seem to be newer, moving forward. A little glitches in some of the funding that's available. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of money slushing around at the federal and the state level. So we're hoping to capture some of that money to subsidize the construction of these units. And then we'll be doing very well. Finally, we'll be able to construct some units that we call workforce housing. Mm -hmm. Because we have a lot of people now that can't even afford to work and live here. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think that's why therapy stores hasn't been able to open mm -hmm. because they cannot find somebody who's willing to commute from who knows where to work uh, either part-time or even full-time to keep that store open. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a dilemma. All the restaurants are having a lot of problems as well. Um, and it's sort of interesting, I'll go ahead and it's just something that came to mind in our last discussion on the uh, short-term rentals. We are finding that a lot of people are doing just what we were afraid of. Staff was sort of worried. We didn't want to just have these individual little motel units kind of popping up. Well, it's happening, and we're having seen that in long-term units. Mm -hmm. We're seeing where uh, from time to time we'll find somebody as a guest house because guest house doesn't have a kitchen at all. And so if you have a legally permitted guest house, you throw in a hot plate, you think you got a dwelling unit to rent out. Not as a short-term rental, but as a long-term rental. So because of our housing crisis, we're seeing people getting kind of creative. I just want to throw it out there as sort of anecdotal issue that we have out there in the real world. Mm -hmm. um, so, so anyways, I guess the bottom line is I'm saying, yeah, we haven't been, you could see by these numbers, we haven't been, we haven't done very well in actually creating affordable housing units, but we're very confident that things have changed in the coming years. I, I heard a report today about uh, a growing problem with mobile home parks, and in that rents for mobile home parks are taking dramatic rises. Um, there's a number of factors, not the least of which is including uh, they're being bought up by mm -hmm. corporate ownership and they're, and so private equity. Mm -hmm. And private equity, and so, um, you know, many people, I presume, who are in mobile home parks are on fixed incomes and limited means. So I don't know, and I, I, you know, I generally don't like the government interfering in market, but this is, this is, I think, an exception. And I, have you heard anything? Is, this, is the state looking at it, or will the count? Can the county or the city take action? Uh, I'll use the word rent control as if I know what it means, but um, some sort of can that this problem be slowed down at all? What tools do we have? And, and you can bring this back. I don't want to take up our time. I, yeah, I, I can chat a little bit about it. Um, you know, from time to time, staff has the opportunity uh, to bend a ear of uh, some of the people up in uh, housing and community development or with SACOG, because we meet with them on a regular basis. In fact, throughout the housing development update program, we, were, um, we had a lot of discussions and workshops with both HCD staff and SACOG staff. But, but, but again, I emphasize that, and I agree with you, Commissioner Friend, I think government needs to get more involved. And I think it's more from the taxation end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. I think, because you're exactly right, um, uh, and I've read article after article that private equity firms mm -hmm. and corporate like Blackstone are buying up thousands of single family yeah. homes, and they've been buying up, I read an article probably a year or two ago about 
um, private equity firms and, and big money buying up these um, mobile home parks. Mm -hmm. yep. Entire and, subdivisions. Yeah, and, and and entire subdivisions. Mm -hmm. And so I think unless the federal government, state government changes the tax code to create a disincentive for certain kinds of real mm -hmm. estate development, I mean, I don't think you're going to see it for multifamily because it's always, you know, but I think single family homes, mobile home parks, those kinds of things, I think there needs to be a way where the tax code can be used to steer that kind of investment away so that the person, the person that really should receive the benefit of the tax code is the owner occupied person that wants to buy that single family home or rent that space in a mobile home park. Instead it's being uh, monetized in a big way. I mean, it's, you read all about it now, it's, but nothing seems to be done. I think that's what needs to be done. I mean, you can do rent control. Uh, it's very, very difficult. It's hard to implement and stuff. Yeah. But maybe that's something we can look at. I, yeah. I, I don't know. I'm not an expert on rent control. <coughs> yeah, I, I see the you know, social economic problems. Yeah. It's huge. I mean, and if you even look at Canada, it's like they've been battling this now. Oh, really? They're so deep into it now. Oh. They're so far behind regulating it that uh, it's basically an out of control beast at oh, this yeah, point. Vancouver a lot of the regulations that you're probably thinking of probably should have been done years ago at this point because of how housing is viewed as investment wise. At least this is my observation. Yeah. Um, the way that people view it as a long term investment versus all the other ways that housing serve, you know, um, yeah. is pretty alarming. Mm -hmm. Especially out of in states that are historically cheaper than California, where it's harder to buy an investment right. property in California when yes. the base price is so high, but when you look at these other places that don't have that high Correct. cost of living, Boom, come in. it's Correct. easy to buy up literally a town, you know, um, and that's happening, yeah. Okay, so do we need to do anything with this? Make a motion to adopt it, make a motion to recommend it, forward it to the receiving file. It is a receiving file. Okay. So, and I just want to just, just commend the commission commissioners that took the time to really dig into the weeds and look at the numbers. Appreciate it because we're going to take it to council and we wanted to get through this process because, you know, it. it it's a difficult table to do, and mm -hmm. and Mr. Painter was the one that did it for the last number of years, not me. So unfortunately, I had some good staff that helped Andrew. They were to help me get through this, and uh, so we can send it off to the state. So any, anyways, thank thanks for reviewing. Well, good job, well, thank staff you. Smart too for getting that out. It's onerous. Okay. Yes. So that is all set to be forwarded to City Council. Thanks everyone for their review. Um, so now we'll move to matter 13, which is matters from commissioners and staff. Do any commissioners have any matters for staff today? I just want to make one observation regarding the um, short-term rental ordinance. And the one of the themes that ran through that ordinance was preservation of neighborhoods. And, and that may come up at some point. We may have to look at that document and say, this is the city's philosophy, because uh, we believe in the preservation of neighborhoods. And uh, again, that's going back to SB 89. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Okay. Any other matters from commissioners for staff? Staff, do anything for us? Uh, just <coughs> just one, one item I want to bring up, and this, and Thank you, Commissioner Friend, for reminding me about SB 910. As you had requested previously, you wanted, you wanted any, um, if there were any attempts or applications mm -hmm. on implementing SB 910. And I'm trying to remember, I think 9 is the one that allows for a ministerial subdivision of the property, a parcel matter. Correct. We, the staff has received one inquiry, and, and the street it was on escapes me. Okay. It would definitely create then two parcels that are substandard to the minimum parcel size in the zone district. Um, we intentionally scheduled sort of a week, and it's gone way past. I haven't heard from from the property owner, but I will keep I'll keep the commission appraised of any of those applications. Appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Anything Do we have else? a meeting? Uh, sorry. No, 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 you're fine. Do we have a, our, a next meeting? Do we need to sponsor? 
Uh, yes, we will have, thanks for asking, we will have another meeting scheduled for us. Great. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, the cell tower application. And I think we okay. Yeah, there's a, a story Super review. Computer. Yeah, there's a historic review yeah. off of Bedford, and then. Okay. Um, uh, the water workshop has a sea land container application. Yes. And then, I'm sorry, could you and then the Broadway couldn't hear you? Um, more uh, workshop on Hospital oh. Drive. Yep. They're gonna they're coming in with a site plan review to install a sea land cargo container. Okay, and that will be on our uh, next agenda. Next mm -hmm. agenda. Okay, we'll to get that one on there. So we have three items. Yes, Yeah. And then uh, a workshop with city council on the whole historic review. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. Um, <clears throat> there was a person that was recommended uh, to cleave, and then he he passed that the name of that person on to me, and I had a long discussion with this person. And this person is an expert more from a let's just say an, an, an architectural slash anthropological view. So um, he's able to do an environmental evaluation of the significance of the building, not not as an architect to be able to <coughs> examine and prescribe uh, the different levels of rehabilitation of the historic building, if that makes sense. And sure. So he strongly recommended then that I need to seek out an actual architect. Okay. So we're, we're trying to do that. Mm -hmm. And then being an architect that specializes in Rehabilitation of historic buildings. There's a few out there, but a lot of them are further away, and we'll probably have to pay for them. And yeah. So um, I'm trying to get some good estimates of what that would cost to bring uh, such an expert out, so we can have that joint meeting. Thank you for asking. And Peter Wolf might have know some folks too. Oh, that's a good. Yeah, and I owe him a call. I'm yeah. Right yeah. Now. It's his yeah. birthday. Peter the Wolf. Mm -hmm. it's his birthday. Oh. birthday. Yeah. Start your call with happy belated birthday. Yeah. <laughs> He's roped me into a lead role in a play. <laughs> you can believe it or not. Oh, that's great. Uh, Vice chair of the planning commission and an yeah. actor? I like it. Yeah. Well, Commissioner Friend. Oh. Actor. <laughs> He's been acting around here for a long time. <laughs> acting up. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, if there is nothing further from anyone, which I'm not seeing, then I will go ahead and adjourn the Clusterville Planning Commission meeting for June 7, 2022 at 7.46 p.m.